Yep, thanks. So let's see, is this, this on? Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Uh, good, so uh, yes, so I'm Daniel Mayerson, I'm at Michigan, and uh, I'm happy to, to in the you know, spirit of, of it being a workshop, tell you about some very uh, preliminary work in progress that uh, I've been doing with uh, Marco Baggio, his postdoc in Leuven, and uh, Anthony Charles, great uh, PhD student in Michigan. Uh, so, yeah, so, so my talk is going to be mainly divided into two parts, let's say. Uh, in the first part, I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to get you excited about this paradigm of supergravity with boundaries. And in principle, this is sort of a technical tool, um, but as I hope I will convince you, this is a technical tool that will give us some, some interesting conceptual uh, progress, let's say, and will tell us something about certain subtleties that might be, might be overlooked otherwise. And then I'm going to go on to uh, a specific theory of supergravity with boundaries, which includes Stern's Simon's term. So I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. But first, let me let me just introduce this subject, uh, and let me introduce it using um, an example. So some some something that we've probably all done, uh, which is uh, holography, uh, holography on ADS spaces, and in uh, when we do holography, we typically need to calculate the on-shell action. Uh, there's a very well uh, understood procedure by now for holographic renormalization to get a nice finite action on, uh, uh, out of this when we calculate the on-shell action. Um, and you know, typically what we do is we, we simply take the bulk action, so this is your supergravity action, and we say, well, this is not really going to give us uh, the right answer. We need to uh, also have a given talking term, which comes from the uh, demanding that the variational problem is well-defined for the metric. And then typically we also need to introduce some covariant counterterms um, to make the action finite. So typically you have divergences. You can think of it as maybe the, the infinite volume of ADS uh, diverging, but then you can regulate this by adding some nice counterterms. Yes, yes. You also need counterterms for the variational no problem, which will be well posed. That is, that is indeed very, very true. Um, and and that's, that's sort of what, what I'm going to get to as well. Um, the, the, the point that, that I want to make here is that um, what, what we typically need is boundary conditions to make sense out of this whole problem. And this kind of leads into um, what, what I, I like to uh, take from this, from this paper here, which is, which is a sort of a logical circle in a sense. So there's, there's, if I want to know what the boundary conditions are of my field, which I typically need to know to, to write down uh, boundary actions, then I need to know what the behavior of my solutions are near the boundary, right? Because otherwise, what, what am I really trying to specify here about my, uh, about my fields? What, are, what am I specifying about my boundary conditions? And, but if I need to know how my solutions can behave near the boundary, this kind of implies already, well, the word says it itself, solutions. I need to know what the, the, what the solutions are solutions of. So this implies that I need to know what the equations of motion are. Now, we like equations of motion to come from actions, and in principle, and in, in specifically from a consistent variational principle of an action. So if we want a consistent variational principle of an action, we typically need to have the action with all of its boundary terms and boundary conditions already specified for us. So you see that we've kind of gotten back to step one, where I've said, well, I kind of want to know what the boundary terms are, and I want to know what the boundary uh, conditions are. Uh, in addition, so, Typically, we're not really that worried about this in practical purposes because we just say, well, we know certain boundary conditions. We're working in this particular class of solutions. I think for, for typical ADS-CFT purposes, we kind of know what, what to do. Um, but this is, this is also something that I would like to point out. Um, you know, we, so in ADS-3, for example, these are the, the, the very well-known brown hand boundary conditions on our fields. But something that uh, especially recently has been, been an object of a lot of study is how, how do we modify this? How can we generalize this? So what I, what I want to say here is that it might not be general or it might not be, um, might not be the right thing that you're writing down when you have guessed uh, certain boundary conditions. It's not obvious that when you write down certain boundary conditions, they are the right thing. Uh, another thing that, that you might worry about is if you write down boundary conditions, are these automatically going to be compatible with supersymmetry? So that's also something you might worry about. Sure. Well, I mean, that is, that's true, but if... Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's true. The equations of motion are not, 
are, are in principle not, not you know, not, uh, we don't care about the boundary terms, but if, 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 if I can be annoying, you know, if I want to derive these equations of motion from an action, then, then you would better have a very well-defined uh, variational principle. Well, yes. Well, okay, so uh, as a... <laughs> Yes, I mean, I, I, I want to be, I, I want things to be. Well, once you, once you find one set, though, so. Right, 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 but this. Well, okay, so. Well, okay. Let's let's not t spend too long on this because this is simply just an, sort of an introduction. But I mean, we can we can we can be uh, uh, pedantic about this, I guess. So I, I guess we would we would agree though that it's not necessarily true that once you found a, a consistent set of boundary conditions, this is the most general and it, and they're unique. So yes. Well. It's out, it, yes, yes, I, I, I agree. I agree. Once you start, yes, that's true. Yes, yes. So okay, I, I think we're not particularly disagreeing on on, <laughs> on the on the conceptual points here. I think what what I what I want to what I want to go is. Co go towards is to to try to find a different um, a different way of working, which in which I don't need to a priori impose these boundary conditions, and a nice framework which I'm which I will try to convince you of is that in when you have supersymmetry in your theory, so in particular I'll be I'll be thinking of supergravity theories, then we can work with uh, the paradigm called supersymmetry without boundary conditions. And what we're basically going to do is we're going to use supersymmetry to improve our action with boundary terms. And we'll see that this, this will, will sort of uh, circumvent the problem of ne needing to impose boundary conditions, and it will make the procedure in certain cases of holographic renormalization easier uh, and even not n need to add extra boundary terms because the boundary terms that we will need from holographic renormalization are actually the boundary terms just determined by supersymmetry. And I'll, yes? Yes, yes, P pretty much so. Yes, yes. Uh huh. Sure. Yeah. It's it's an extra principle, and without having to do it a priori, I'm saying this principle is going to select it for you without any any work in a sense for. It. So let me uh, so let me just start from a very very from the very basics. Um, so I'm going to to talk to you about actions. Uh, and usually when we say an action is invariant under symmetries, we say that the variation of this action is just zero. However, usually the Lagrangian change is under a total derivative. So if we have a boundary, uh, in particular, this total derivative uh, will turn into a boundary term, to a surface term. So let's say, you know, in my talk, I'll use this to denote the boundary. And then let's say there's a coordinate r, and the boundary is at r equals zero. Um, you can think of this in terms of holography, but not necessarily. So here, it seems that the variation of our action has now become a boundary term. And so if, I'm, uh, if I look at this, I say, well, supersymmetry seems to be completely broken. So my theory is not supersymmetric anymore. Now, if I just, um, now, of course, I can, I can say, you know, why don't I just say, well, whatever this is here, you know, this is going to be some function of, functional of the, of the fields in my theory. Why don't I just impose some boundary conditions on my fields such that this term is 0? Right? And then I've restored supersymmetry. Now, I hope that I've, I've convinced you that this might not be the most general way to do things. Um, and it, in principle, you could do this, of course, but you might be restricting your solutions uh, a bit too much. And I'll, I'll give you, hopefully, some example of this. Um, I think a, 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 nicer, a nicer way to think of this is, let's add boundary terms to the action and really just 
just very simple. I have a variation of my bulk action gives me this boundary term. Let's just find a boundary term that will give minus this variation, right? And if you do this and you think about it, you see that you can restore half of the supersymmetries uh, in general. So if you think of projecting my spinner into plus and minus chirality with respect to the, the transverse direction, then we have to break half of these. I, I like to think of this as because the commutator of the, of the two of these guys, the plus and minus chirality, sort of gives you transverse uh, translations. And we know that transverse translations are, of course, not a symmetry anymore when we have a boundary. So, uh, so this is what I just said. Our fully supersymmetric action will now be our bulk action and some improvement term here that lives on the boundary uh, that renders this entire action now supersymmetric under half of the supersymmetries. So um, in addition, we, can al we always have the freedom uh, to add an extra boundary action, which is supersymmetric by itself. So uh, we just add another boundary, boundary action here that's supersymmetric by itself. And so our full, uh, most general supersymmetric action is our improved bulk action plus some extra boundary uh, action. Now let me, let me try to convince you why, why I should care about this procedure at all. Um, and you know, this might be just some kind of technical cutesy trick that I'm, that I'm explaining here, but, but you know, is it really useful? So, one, um, so the first example I want to give is, is uh, very simply minimally super, minimal supergravity in three dimensions. Uh, so this was first studied in, I think, the first supergravity paper that uses this, uh, uses this formalism of, of supersymmetry without boundary conditions. Uh, and then it was applied to holography by Grumler and from Neuenhuis, and so I'll get to that on uh, one of my next slides. Um, so the starting point is just 3D off-shell supergravity. So the, the fields in the multiplet are just your gravi graviton, your gravitino, and some auxiliary scalar that we don't care too much about. You see that if you integrate it out here, you'll just get um, S is zero as its equation of motion. But uh, since we're working in a general off-shell formalism, we're keeping it. I'm going to suppress fermion terms uh, because we typically don't care that much about fermion terms. Um, and it turns out if you go through this procedure, you see that this trans uh, transforms under a with a total derivative under supersymmetry. And the appropriate boundary term to add to your uh, action is exactly this. So there's a minus s here. Uh, note that the E3 or E2 are just your Wielbein determinants either on the boundary or in the bulk. So now at this point, it's, um, we do have a supersymmetric action, but it's kind of weird because we have a linear, we have this auxiliary field here, S, appearing linearly on the boundary. Um, now you might think, well, we've kind of just shifted the problem. That's, that's indeed true. But the, the solution in this, in this framework is, 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 is quite nice, I think, in that we can just add another supersymmetric action, right? So a separately supersymmetric action. So this, uh, this action here is supersymmetric by itself. Under, uh, under the supersymmetries that I've preserved. And this is nothing more than just this s, so plus s will cancel with this minus s. We get rid of these annoying linear terms, and uh, you need your extrinsic curvature here too. So here, of course, we see the gibbons hawking term appearing uh, in, in our boundary action as we kind of knew it would, it would have to. So, yeah. In principle, you could, yeah. I mean, uh, from, the, from the viewpoint of, of just having a supersymmetric action, you could. Um, but but the, the, again, you're, we're, we're sort of thinking of this, of get, getting rid of this linear term, is, which is why I'm adding a particular coefficient. So there, there's definitely a, an input there. Well, you have to add it with this coefficient. Otherwise, I think your, your equations of motion basically tell you something like your, your E2 field bind determinant has to be zero, something like that on the boundary, yeah. So that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So your, uh, your full action is then going to be your bulk part and your boundary part, which uh, the linear terms in S cancel, and you just get uh, the, the given talking term, essentially. Now you can do the same procedure when you add a cosmological constant to the, to the problem. Um, if you add a cosmological constant in the bulk, you can do this in an off-shell formalism by adding this term here. Uh, so one over L is your uh, is your anti-desitter anti radius, if you will. 
And then um, if you follow this procedure, you need a new improvement term on the boundary, which is simply this minus 1 over L. So at this point, uh, of course, the, the comparison is very, uh, very easy to make. So I've now gone on shell. So what does this mean? I've, I've eliminated my auxiliary scalar S, uh, which gives me this cosmological constant now. Uh, so now I've gone uh, on shell in the sense that I have no auxiliary fields. And my on-shell Lagrangian is simply uh, my normal bulk Lagrangian for ADS, and I have this boundary term here. Now, if I would have started with my bulk Lagrangian and done a procedure of holographic re renormalization in ADS3, then I would have, of course, uh, done pretty much exactly the same thing. I would have added my Gibbons Hawking term, and I would have added, uh, I would have had to add a counter term to uh, regularize the, the on-shell action. So what I'm trying to what I'm trying to point out here is that this is this fully supersymmetric action that I've just constructed for you, just using supersymmetry essentially, is on shell just exactly the finite holographically renormalized on shell action. Now you might say, well, it, it, you know, what else what else could it be? And it's kind of you know I've kind of just rephrased things in a way to to put supersymmetry more in uh, in the spotlight, and I think that's that's a fair that's a fair statement. Um, at this point, you might also you might not be too um, convinced or too too enthusiastic about this because really it's just another way of getting something that we know how to get uh, from other methods. However, my second example I think is a is a very is a very nice example. Uh, very recently, so this is a, a paper by Friedman, Pilch, Pufu, and Warner from just uh, November, uh, and they did the same thing in four dimensions. So they looked at gauged n equals eight supergravity. So on a, with an ADS-4 background, and this is uh, supposed to be dual to an ABGM theory in three dimensions. Now, it's not terribly important for my talk what, you know, what ABGM is and what, what's in it, et cetera, but what is important is um, the results of their paper. So they look at, in particular, ABGM uh, has certain scalar operators which sit in some representation of SO8, and you can prove um, very nicely in field theory that their three-point function is non-zero. So this, uh, this three-point function you would want to uh, reproduce from the bulk, from uh, holography. And so what you do on, on the bulk side, so on the gauge supergravity side, is you know that if you have scalar operators in your field theory, they should be dual to some bulk uh, scalar fields. Uh, you can see which scalar fields they are. And then you would, uh, would in principle, think that this three-point function should be determined entirely by the A cubed couplings in the supergravity action. However, it seems that, um, uh, well, however, there are no A cubed terms in the supergravity action, and so what you're left with is concluding that it seems like the three-point function of these scalar operators is zero. Now, um, the resolution is simply to do the procedure that I was just talking about. So you say, well, look, my gate supergravity action here, since I'm working in ADS, I have a boundary, uh, and if I have to, you know, I have to be precise about what I mean by supersymmetry, and uh, in principle, I need to add new boundary terms to my to my action to make it supersymmetric again. And so they did this procedure, and they found that this full supersymmetric action now does contain a cube terms on the boundary, and these a cube terms nicely reproduce the non-zero three-point function in the CFT. Uh, and in addition, like in three dimensions, the situation that I was just talking about. It, the fully supersymmetric action also contains the right counter terms that you need for holographic normalization. So, of course, when we write down a finite uh, on-shell action in holography, we have the freedom of adding finite counter terms to it. However, what I'm trying to say here is that supersymmetry will impose certain finite counter terms for you, and these might be very important that you select these particular finite counter terms if you want to reproduce the correct things in the in the dual field theory. Do, do you mean in the CFT or in the bulk? Um, well, I think it's it's just you're you just expect it to be this three point vertex in in, in the bulk. You mean uh, That's true, yeah. 
Um, no, I think it's it's the same. I I guess I don't understand the. Yeah. Well, I, I. Well, I yeah okay. I, I I have to admit I'm I'm not terribly familiar with the technical details. It's quite a long uh, technical paper, but I think it's at the at the very least suggestive that they seem to get the right answer from these from these terms. Um, good. Uh, yes, this this is true. This is true. Uh, good. So, so this example and uh, and the previous examples were were to, to try to convince you that this 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 technical tool, in a sense, just to look at uh, supersymmetry with boundaries, is, or, or, sorry, supergravity with boundaries, and to impose supersymmetry on my action is a nice tool and will give me some non-trivial results. Now, what I want to move on to now is uh, going to uh, supersymmetric turn simons theories when we have boundaries. So. Uh, so far, you know, what I've talked about is when we take our fully supersymmetric action, right, I've told you this is a bulk piece and then some improvement uh, boundary piece and then maybe an extra boundary piece that's separately supersymmetric. They've all been functions of or functionals of the same field. So the, the bulk fields uh, and then the bulk fields that then are restricted to the boundary, obviously. Now, what I, what I will try to convince you of is that for turn simons theories, what you really need to do is you need to is you need to add new fields that only live on the boundary. So this means that your improvement terms and your boundary terms, in general, your boundary action will depend on new dynamical fields, so there will be kinetic terms for these fields, that you do not see at all in the bulk Lagrangian. So this seems very mysterious. Um, just a little, a little aside, well, why, why would you think turn simons is special? Well, turn simons actions break, uh, break gauge invariance when you have boundaries. This is nothing new. Uh, this this guy transforms with a total derivative, and you get a boundary term when you do a gauge transformation. This is, of course, absolutely nothing new. This is essentially what a uh, Westminster Witten model is, and you get a boundary gauge mode out of this uh, gauge transformation that is that that doesn't vanish on the boundary. This gives you something uh, which is a bosonic degree of freedom. And if since I've been harping on supersymmetry, what you would be worried about is well, where is the superpartner for this uh, for this guy? So um, you're, you're talking about just just pure U1 gauge theory, turn Simon's theories. Okay. Well, well, we can certainly. So I, I'm not sure exactly what what you mean, but we can certainly talk about when I have when I have some boundary terms written down. If you if you uh, if you want to comment then. Um, so I think the the nicest way to understand this this uh, this this problem or this this issue is to use the superfield formalism. Now. Um, in superfield formalism, we can, of course, uh, let's let's stick to global supersymmetry. By the way, uh, we can look at you know 3D minimal super uh, super supersymmetry, and we can look at some gauge multiplet. So a gauge multiplet um, comes into a nice gauge superfield, and in 3D minimal supersymmetry, we have a gauge superfield which carries a spinner index here a. Uh, inside this gauge superfield sits a spinner uh, chi, another spinner lambda, which we typically would call the gauge eno. We have, of course, our vector, and then there's an extra scalar. Now, typically, what we do in superfield formalism with uh, with a gauge field is impose a Westomino gauge. Now, in this case, we can impose a Westomino gauge, which will set my extra uh, fermion and my extra scalar to zero, so leaving just the gauge eno in the gauge field. Now, the the crucial point that I want to that I want to say is that it doesn't really make a lot of sense to impose a certain gauge when you have no gauge invariance. So, in this case, we 
I, I want to argue that imposing the Wesso Mino gauges is a restriction that really does restrict the physics of the theory. It's not just uh, getting rid of some extra gauge degrees of freedom. If you go through the same procedure that I was talking about before, you write down your bulk action. So your bulk action here is just your typical churn simons term and its superpartner. Notice that the gauge Eno doesn't have a, dyna uh, a dynamical kinetic term. This is, of course, very, very reasonable from the bulk point of view. There's no bulk degrees of freedom for this guy, so there shouldn't be any bulk degrees of freedom for the fermion either. However, <coughs> as I was saying, uh, if you go through this procedure and you, you say, well, I want to make this supersymmetric now, uh, you use superfield, uh, you use a superfield formalism for the supersymmetri supersymmetry with boundaries, then you find that you need to add these boundary terms. So not only do you have a v squared term, but you also have, um, but you also have this new term here that involves chi. So chi comes from this superfield, of course. This is one of the gauge degrees of freedom that I that I would usually get rid of in the West Amino gauge, and this now appears on the boundary with a kinetic term. So this is really a new dynamical chiral fermion on the boundary. And of course, from the, from the perspective of what I was just saying, this is perfectly reasonable. A churn simons term uh, in presence of a boundary has a nice, has a chiral boson degree of freedom on the boundary, and this is simply, uh, you should think of this as its super partner, essentially. Uh, if you want to do the same thing for an n equals two gauge multiplet, you can, and you will see that besides uh, two of these guys, two chiral fermions, which you can combine into a nice complex fermion, you also get a new dynamical scalar on the boundary. So I, I want to highlight that you get a new dynamical bosonic field on the boundary. Good. So, um, right. So, so w you might now wonder, well, does this have any applications in holography? And I think that, um, so first of all, I should mention that, you know, up to now we've been using global supersymmetry to, to discuss these turn Simons terms because nobody has uh, worked on the local version yet, uh, so for the, for the supergravity. Uh, but we can still say something general about general expectations um, that, we, he w that we can learn from the 3D n equals 2 gauge multiplet. So as I said, there's a new dynamical uh, fermion, complex fermion, and a new dynamical scalar A on the boundary. So this was discussed um, briefly in, in a paper by Benini and Bobef uh, a few years ago. So if you have 3D n equals 2 supergravity on on ADS, this is uh, thought to be dual to some uh, zero comma two su superconformal field theory. In such a field theory, you have current multiplets, and so if you have a, a, a gauge field in the bulk, this will be dual to uh, a current on the boundary, and this current better sit in a current multiplet. Now, a current multiplet in the n equals zero comma two theory, a right moving current multiplet, is formed by the current and a free complex fermion and a free scalar. So once again, just from the point of view of supersymmetry, uh, holographically, this is exactly what we would expect to find new fields, right? We want to have these guys because otherwise, where are these, the rest of my current multiplet? Um, so I think that, that it would be very nice to, to do some nice computations in, in holography, some explicit computations in holography, and this is uh, exactly what our, what our work in progress is. So so far, we've written down the n equals one local Susie gauge multiple action, and we're working on the n equals two guy, which we will need to uh, to do for duality with zero comma two su superconformal field theories, and in particular to uh, work out something called the supersymmetric Casimir energy. So at this point, uh, at this point, maybe I'll ask if there are any questions at the moment, but then I'll move on. Okay. So at this point, I think I've I've tried to make a story about. Um, churn simons theories and how supersymmetry forces you to add some new dynamical freedom, uh, degrees of freedom on the boundary. And uh, I think this, this story in 3D, at least from the perspective of global supersymmetry, is somewhat understood in local supersymmetry while we're working on it. But I, I now want to go into the, the terrain of speculation, and I want to talk about 5D supergravity and the supersymmetric Casimir energy. So. I'll get to what supersymmetric Casimir energy is in a moment, but I want to uh, want to highlight first that if you're looking at 5D supergravity, so we're looking at an ADS-5 CFT4 setup, minimal supergravity has um, the metric gauge field and a gravitino, and your your gauge field has a churn simons term. So if I just naively say, well, this is a churn simons term, just like I was thinking of in three dimensions before, then 
I should probably have some new boundary terms wh which in include new dynamical fields. Now these terms would be important if I have some bosonic fields that I have to introduce on the boundary when evaluating the on-shell supergravity Lagrangian. Uh, and in particular, uh, well, you, this, this might be true or not, but it might, it might mostly matter when you have a non-trivial gauge field turned on. And as I will try to explain in just a few minutes, this is relevant when you, have the super, when you want to ca calculate the supersymmetric Casimir energy holographically. So first let me just tell you what this supersymmetric Casimir energy is. So uh, I think it was introduced in this paper, but there, there are a lot of papers uh, with um, subsets or, or uh, additional authors, uh, et cetera. Uh, so this is something that, that has been studied a lot uh, in, in recent years. And it's essentially a, a generalization of your normal Casimir energy in 2D. So in 2D, we know that if we have a 2D CFT on a torus, S1 cross S1, we take um, the, the, the radius of this, of this one S1 to infinity. We know that the partition function basically behaves like this. And so this is how you can pick out your Casimir energy. If you look at higher dimensions, uh, you might think to introduce a Casimir energy in the similar way uh, on S1 cross S3 on a higher dimension or cylinder, but this is not, <coughs> excuse me, this is not physical uh, in the sense that this Casimir energy, you can show that it depends on your particular renormalization scheme. So there are certain finite counter terms that you can introduce in your CFT that will just change it. However, um, what, what these guys pointed out is that in superconformal field theories, you can define something that is very similar, but, um, but is physical. So there's something called the supersymmetric Casimir energy, again, on this, on this cylinder. Uh, and this is physical, which means a scheme, scheme independent. And in particular, um, just schematically, your partition function behaves as e to the minus beta e, so similar to up here, uh, times your uh, superconformal index. And in general, this is, uh, this is just something I want to point out. In general, your, your supersymmetric Casimir energy is going to be a function, of course, of, of the variables in your CFT theory. So your central charges, and also if your S3 is somewhat warped or something, then it will be some function of, of this warping. So it will depend on your, on your geometry. And the good thing about this uh, Casimir energy is it can be computed with localization. So we know what it is in the field theory. And of course, we would like to match it in uh, holography. Um, so this, this was done by, uh, I think the, the, the last paper was this one, which is, which is a big, uh, a very big work to, 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 to really make the problem precise, because of course I wouldn't be talking about it if, there was, uh, if it was all figured out. Um, so holographically, you basically just want to compute the on-shell action of Euclidean ADS with some non-trivial gauge field turned on. So it's, there's some non-trivial gauge field on the boundary on this, on this S1 of the S1 cross S3. So if you go through the normal procedure of calculating the on-shell action, the renormalized on-shell action, you will see that it does not reproduce the supersymmetric Casimir energy. There is a mismatch. And in fact, to reproduce it, uh, this is what these guys showed, we need to add particular finite counter terms, but these counter terms cannot be expressed covariantly. So what, what I mean by that is um, they know what the counter terms have to be in terms of, let's say, the functions, uh, the, the warping of the S3, Right, so of the metric, uh, of, the, of the geometry. But you cannot express these counter terms uh, in terms of the, the bulk fields, so in terms of the metric and your gauge field. So this seems to be some kind of holographic mismatch. But what I would like to just point out here is that, well, what about uh, counter terms that might involve these new dynamical bosonic fields? So it might be that if you add these, uh, these, these, these boundary terms to your action, that that might be precisely the boundary terms that you need. Um, and, and indeed, they would not be expressible in terms of the bulk fields, because you need these new boundary fields uh, to be able to express these counter terms. So I think uh, I won't, won't uh, mention too much the recent work that suggests otherwise, uh, except to say that there, there's some other recent work that by Papa Dimitri and also An, uh, this is very recent, so just just in March. That well, they 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 suggest that actually no, the the field theory result is in a sense wrong. The previous field theory result is wrong, um, and in particular, you can't use localization in these field theories. But um, we should really trust holography 
and we should we should trust the holographic de derivation and this implies that there are certain anomalies uh, in my super uh, in my super supercurrent transformation which will uh, which will sort of solve this problem in a sense so Yes, yes, yes. But they, they say there's an obstruction to, to localization because the, your, the operator that you would think is Q exact is actually not uh, Q exact. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I think, okay, so th this is this, I, I was expecting to, to <laughs> have, uh, have, have a discussion, but um, I think the, the, the key point that I, that I have as a question mark here is that Yes, the, the general form of, of the anomalous relations that they derive is, is probably just something that depends on, on symmetry is basically the problem. So they, they're able to write down the most general word identities for the supercurrents, et cetera. But the, the actual form, the actual, um, when, then you start using holography to, to say what are these anomalies, et cetera. And that, I think, uses the 5D supergravity Lagrangian. So I'm not quite sure if that's, if that's the complete action then to, to, to calculate these things. But but I'm I'm very glad to to discuss later. Yes. So. So so yes, I think in, in at at the very least, I can say this is a still a. Still a debate, um, still an open debate. But I just wanted to want, just wanted to to, to flash this uh, to say that you know perhaps these 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 boundary terms might be might be of interest in solving this problem. Okay, so with that, I'll just uh, summarize quickly. Um, I I hope I've convinced you that you know a very general framework to work with SUSY theories when you have a boundary is to add some boundary terms uh, to preserve supersymmetry. And uh, I've given you some examples of that. I've showed you that in Chern Simons theories, when you have supersymmetric Chern Simons theories, this leads to new dynamical fields on the boundary, even. And these are not uh, at all mysterious when you think of holography. They're expected, even, to, comp to complete current multiplets. Um, and then I think a, a more speculative thing is you know, maybe these, these kind of terms are important for matching the supersymmetric Casimir energy in ADS5 uh, to the CFT4 computation. So just a few more things that, so there's the obvious things uh, that, that are left to do, which is to, to work out the n equals 2 supergravity uh, with Chern Simons terms, with Chern Simons gauge fields, which then will give us some nice uh, uh, handle on holography for these 0 0.2 superconformal field theories, uh, which is something that hasn't, hasn't been done a lot. So that might be nice to do. Of course, there's the 5D minimal supergravity puzzle, so to try to understand supersymmetric Casimir energy. And of course, you might try to do other uh, theories with Chern Simons terms. So, for example, 7D supergravity also has a Chern Simon term. And in general, I think there's more general uh, questions that you can ask. Uh, and one of them is you know, do, do my supersymmetric boundary terms always give me the right uh, holographic renormalization counter terms? Or are there some examples where perhaps supersymmetry is, is not quite enough? I think these are these are some interesting questions. There's a lot more, but uh, I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, yeah, just a very quick question because from the examples that you showed, the improvement term was the the counter term that you would get if you had Dirichlet boundary conditions. So it seems like you're saying, oh, preserving supersymmetry is compatible with Dirichlet boundary conditions. If I wanted to impose Neumann boundary conditions, so I think I think what I, what I want to say is that once you've done this procedure correctly, um, of course you will still need to impose boundary conditions. But these boundary conditions will flow from the from the from the from the from the, a from the action basically from varying the action. You will get uh, the variation of the action will look like you know. P uh, del Q, and then you can either choose to, to take Q constant or P zero, right? And that's basically saying I'm either going to select New Newman or, or Dirichlet boundary conditions. But, but this procedure will sort of automatically split out what are the correct boundary conditions that would sit in a 
in a super super multiplet, for example, which, which so which boundary conditions can I choose that are all going to be compatible with each other with supersymmetry, for example? It doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I'm either choosing Dirichlet or, or Neumann boundary conditions uh, from the offset. Yeah, that's the thing. In the yeah. Like yeah. Automatically in Dirichlet, and so what is the knob there? Because the extrinsic curvature tells you that you're fixing the boundary. Yeah. Metric. Yeah. Well, metric? yeah. So, so I, I think in gravity, there's there's not probably a whole lot. Yeah. But yeah. Are those compatible with supersymmetry? And so there's just a, some subset of supersymmetry if terms that you neglected that just close among themselves, or or is it Neumann boundary conditions break supersymmetry, and that's why you don't see them? Um, I'm not sure what. I'm I'm not I'm not sure I'm not sure to be honest. Yeah. I'm not sure maybe. Someone else knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's. Uh, I'm not. I'm not completely sure. All I know is, uh, so, so for example, if you if you try to do, let's see. An example that I can remember um, is maybe maybe the, like the n equals one gauge theory, on uh, 3D 3D trans Simons theory. You can usually choose. There's there's either combination of some Dirichlet and some Neumann boundary conditions, and then there's a different combination that you can choose, and sort of both of them, you know, sit in a different uh, super multiple, let's say. So you can there's there's different options there. So I'm not particularly sure about gravity, but yeah. just to be sure I understood your speculation. Yeah. So the Casimir energy is supposed to be universal because there's no supersymmetric counter term, right, that will remove it. In the holographic calculation, are you saying that we don't know if supersymmetry has been respected, so we have been, the mismatch is due to subtracting a non-supersymmetric counter term in the field theory, is this your point? Uh, I, guess, I guess my point would be that, that I, I wonder if the supergravity calculation, um, yeah, it somehow subtracts a non-supersymmetric counter term. Yeah, I, w I guess that's the way to put it. Yeah. Well, I think the field theory computation is is pretty manifestly supersymmetric. Very briefly, clarify what a couple of points. Uh, so one was just a trivial point, was a reference point. The, the supersymmetric Casimir energy was introduced in a paper with uh, Assel and David de Cassin. Oh, sorry, yeah. Previous year. Uh, but apart from that, in the recent papers with the group in Oxford, uh, what we did was, uh, uh, in a way, um, well, like a toy version of what you are proposing, in the sense that we compute the variation of the, of the ordinary action. We find it's different from zero. And then we add the boundary term that restores the total invariance that makes it uh, um, supersymmetric. But by supersymmetric, what I mean is really making some variation of, the, of some bosonic moduli that are known to be associated with supersymmetry. So we don't compute any fermions yeah. in, in the explicit computation, but the variation that we make is, is a, is a, is a, should be invariant, but it's not, and we compensate with a boundary term. Uh, now, the, the, whether this boundary term is acceptable or not is a, is a huge debate. Yeah, thanks.